Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Klingberg Wing Mark II Development. I'm Raul Klingberg, your host. Today's video is all about composite tubing. Today I'm going to show you all of my secrets on how I produce composite tubing inexpensively. You can make this tubing out of carbon fiber, Kevlar, fiberglass, any composite material you desire. I've worked on these processes for many years and they are proven to produce high quality tubing very affordably. Uh, as if you've shopped around for carbon fiber tubing, you know it can be very expensive, 10, 12, $15 a foot, sometimes more. You're gonna be able to do it for a fraction of that cost. And what I'm starting off here showing you is probably the key component of the process, and that is graphite powder. Uh, when you go to the hardware store or your home repair store, you'll find this graphite powder probably near where they make the keys. It's quite often used as a lubricant in locks. And that component or that material is critical to making this tubing. We're gonna make this tubing on a straight mandrel, no taper required, and the graphite powder is key to removing uh, the finished product from the mandrel. So without further ado, let's begin. At the start of the video here, you'll see me applying the graphite powder uh, to what appears to be my workbench, uh, but that's not the case. There's a thin layer of polyester plastic on the table, and it's very hard to see in the video, but you'll see me wrap it around the tube shortly here. I'm applying a little bit of graphite powder on each side of the tube, and I'll put a little bit on top of the tube, and uh, that'll allow the plastic sleeve that I'm going to wrap around the tube to slide off easily after the uh, composite tubing is cured. Uh, one of the key aspects of this process is to sand the aluminum tube that you're using as a mandrel prior to uh, setting up for uh, making composite tubes. You want to sand it lengthwise with some 60 or 80 grit sandpaper, make some nice grooves in it, uh, and those grooves will hold the graphite powder uh, equally around the tubing and allow the plastic sleeve to slide off. Now this uh, polyester or mylar sleeve that I'm wrapping around the tube right now is two mils thick, and I do recommend that you buy polyester, not mylar. You'll pay quite a premium for the mylar brand name. Uh, that plastics are available in any plastic supply store like Tap Plastics. I use the two mil thick because it's uh, easy to wrap around the tube and easy to remove from the composite tube when you're done. This plastic strip or sleeve that I'm putting around the tube is about two tenths of an inch uh, wider than it needs to be, uh, giving about two tenths of an inch overlap. And that's so that I can seal it off so the epoxy doesn't sneak through to the aluminum tube. You see me putting on a series of cross strips here on the seam. Uh, that's so I can snug the plastic to the tube. You don't want it too tight. You don't want it too loose. Just snug, just tight enough so that you can easily slide the, uh, the polyester sleeve back and forth on the aluminum tube. Now, another key factor in this process is to make sure that your aluminum tube or whatever mandrel you're using is absolutely round. It must be as close to round as possible. If it's slightly out of round or oval, uh, when you go to remove the composite tube and you twist on it a little bit, it will lock up and you'll never get it off. Here you see me doing a test slide on the polyester sleeve to make sure that I don't have it too tight on the tube. If you did get it too tight, well, you're just simply going to have to cut it loose, cut a new piece of polyester and start over again. Uh, it's very difficult to remove all the tape. Now I'm going to begin to apply tape lengthwise along the seam and you'll see me attempt to put on a fairly long strip here which isn't going to work out well. The polyester sleeve is going to buckle on me and despite my years of experience I still make boo-boos. So I'm going to have to go back and put on more cross strips and do shorter uh, lengthwise strips of tape. I should also note that I'm using the frosted scotch tape here. Uh, you really don't want to do that. Uh, it has a tendency to stick to the epoxy, even with mold release on it. I recommend that you use the absolutely clear scotch tape. A little bit harder to find, but look around in your office supply store, you'll find it. Uh, the clear stuff uh, it provides a much better release of the composite tube when you're done. So here you get to see me struggle a little bit with this stuff. It happens to the best of us. and um, I'll probably fast forward at this point so that you can uh, get up to the good stuff. But you need to seal this seam uh, completely uh, so the epoxy doesn't get through. And let's skip forward to the next step of the process. Okay, so now I'm finished uh, 
sealing up that seam. I made a final check to make sure that the mylar sleeve will slide off, <laughs> the polyester sleeve will slide off the aluminum tube. And uh, here you see me taping the end of it. That's so it doesn't move on the tube anymore. That needs to be rigid in place uh, for doing the layup. Uh, today I'm going to be doing a layup with uh, uh, a helically wound, woven uh, carbon fiber sleeve and some uh, biaxial woven uh, cloth uh, doublers. Uh, what I'm making here are a pair of tubes uh, for testing uh, as the uh, torque drive tubes for the elements. And the doublers are where I'm going to put fittings in the tubes uh, for doing the testing. and. Uh, You'll see in a moment how they work. So we're getting the gloves on. Uh, we're going to mix up some epoxy and uh, begin the process. Uh, so I'm going to skip forward here. I'm sure you all know how to make <laughs> mix up some epoxy. I'm going to skip forward to where we uh, begin the layout. Okay, after I have the epoxy mixed up, I'm going to move on to preparing the polyester sleeve. I'm using a spray-on petroleum-based uh, release agent for the tubing. Uh, this is so that the polyester can be removed from the inside of the composite tube when it's complete. I just simply spray it on the outside. Very easy to use, a lot easier than using wax and PVA or any of the other releases. Uh, this type of mold release is available on Amazon or from other sources. It's not inexpensive, but it sure is easy to use. There, I'm done. Uh, spray it on, it's ready to go. And uh, I've mixed up uh, epoxy from Tap Plastics. It's their four to one mix ratio. Uh, super hard epoxy has excellent mechanical properties. I use it for a lot of my work. It's one drawback is short pot life. You only have about a 10 or 15 minute pot life. So if you're unaccustomed to the process that you're doing, I recommend that you select an epoxy with a longer pot life. So we make it sure it's uh, good and thoroughly mixed. And I'll talk a little bit about the doublers before we get to them. As you uh, learn to make these composite tubes, you'll quickly discover that uh, you can do some very interesting tricks in terms of wall thickness and doublers. Depending upon the shape of the doubler, uh, you can create uh, tapered wall thicknesses in one direction, two directions. Uh, you, If it's not a straight taper you want, you can do a geometric progression uh, taper. Uh, depends on uh, what you want in terms of uh, tubing mechanical properties and by cutting uh, the cloth properly for these doublers, uh, you can create almost an infinite, infinite variety of uh, types of tubing uh, with different properties. I'm sure somebody out there who's much better at the math than me could actually figure out what uh, equation you'd want applied to the cut edge of the carbon fiber cloth to give you the uh, final result in a wall thickness taper to give the uh, mechanical properties that you want. You see me wetting out this cloth right on my table. That's not actually the work surface. I have some uh, uh, releasable uh, shelf paper attached to my table and when I'm done I just uh, peel it off and throw it away. Uh, recently I found a much uh, less expensive alternative. I'm buying large rolls of brown butcher paper and it actually has a very thin polyethylene plastic backing on it and you can lay that down on the table, work on one side, uh, it gets all gooey with epoxy but the plastic backing prevents the epoxy from going through to your work surface. When you're done, you just roll up the paper and throw it away. Uh, really handy, inexpensive stuff to use. Uh, the rolls of uh, large rolls of that paper are available on Amazon, of course, along with the holder cutting device for uh, storing it for uh, easy usage. So I'm wetting out uh, the doublers here first. Uh, that's so that the epoxy will tack up slightly uh, before I use them. Uh, if you try to wrap them when they are completely wet and uh, not even the least little bit stiff, uh, they can be very difficult to apply. The fabric will skew on you and so forth. Uh, if you're the lucky owner of an autoclave, uh, this is a much easier process. You would just buy a pre preg cloth, uh, pull it out of the freezer, cut it to size, wrap it around the tube, and pop it in the autoclave. Much easier. Uh, but I don't own an autoclave. I have a cheap little light bulb oven to uh, speed up the cure times and I have to work with uh, wet layups. Here you see me wetting out the uh, carbon fiber sleeve. This type of sleeving material is uh, 
available from CST Sales. They have a wide variety of sizes. Uh, when you buy a nominal size, say you buy a one inch uh, diameter size, uh, that sleeve can usually be pulled tight down to say three quarter inch diameter or expanded up to say an inch and a quarter diameter. Here I'm flipping it over so that I uh, wet out the opposite side also. Um, I've played with this a couple of different ways, uh, trying to get it on the tube wet and trying to get it on the tube dry. Uh, right now, I think I'm at the uh, preference of uh, putting it on the tube first before I wet it out. Although you have to be very careful to make sure that you have it fully wetted on the tube uh, before you uh, close it up or do any over wraps. I felt this way, at least I could check the tube and make sure that it was fully wetted out before I, I applied it to the mandrel. Uh, but it is a little bit uh, sticky gooey and sometimes difficult to slip on the mandrel. You'll also see me uh, struggle a little bit here uh, when I apply this uh, braided sleeve uh, to the mandrel. Uh, I don't have a, a good tapered fit, uh, fid, I think they call them, on the end of the tube uh, to allow it to open up uh, the carbon fiber sleeve. I just got some tape wrapped around there and it got kind of hung up. But, you know, a little fiddly work, playing around with it, uh, I got it on there eventually. Uh, but I would recommend that you take something, say, like a plastic model rocket nose cone and glue it in the end of the tube, and that'll provide you a nice tapered surface for sliding sleeves on. Of course, you don't have to use this braided sleeve. I'm using the braided sleeve because I wanted a high stiffness and torque, and because the sleeve is woven nominally at a 45-degree angle, you get that... Uh, high torque uh, stiffness uh, immediately from this cloth. You can also use uh, just plain biaxially woven uh, fabric and uh, roll the tube up on it, uh, wrap it around the tube. Uh, you can do spiral wraps of uh, unidirectional. That's quite common. Uh, you're really only limited by your imagination. You can do inner layer. On my first glider, I used a uh, layer of uh, 120 Kevlar, uh, which is 1.8 ounce Kevlar. I'd put that down first on the table and on top I would put on unidirectional carbon fiber uh, cloth. And as I rolled it around the tube, you get alternate layers between uh, Kevlar and graphite. Of course, that does reduce the ultimate strength of the tube, but the handy thing is, is it provides a bit of a yield zone on the tubing. And for the pilot's cage on my first wing, that was very important. Uh, and also it protects a pilot if the tubing does break in a bad landing. You don't have needle sharp shards of carbon fiber stabbing the pilot everywhere. So if uh, you're making tubing that's going to be exposed to uh, any people, uh, if it gets broken, I recommend that you do at least at least uh, one over wrap of Kevlar on the outside uh, to protect against uh, uh, potential injury from shards of carbon fiber. Uh, when you do break these uh, tubes, they will give off uh, little pieces of uh, cured carbon fiber that are needle sharp uh, and uh, hurts quite a bit when you get them in your skin. It's happened to me a couple of times, so I do recommend the carbon fiber, or excuse me, the Kevlar over wrap. Here you see me struggling a little bit to get it on the tube. As you push it forward uh, on the tube, it actually increases in diameter and slips over the tube. Uh, this would be slide on much easier if the carbon fiber were not uh, soaked in epoxy. Uh, and uh, you can try both ways, uh, see which way you like best. Uh, I've done them both ways and I'm sticking with dry, but uh, that's I feel comfortable with dry because I know when I have the cloth uh, wetted out. Uh, if you're not confident in that, uh, wet them out before you put them on and just struggle a little bit to put it on. I got to admit that uh, making the tubing this way with the sleeve uh, a, is very attractive in terms of making a tube that's uh, very strong in torsion, but it is a little bit more difficult to make the tubing. When you do a simple roll wrap of the fabric, it goes much faster. And uh, you get different properties, uh, but you know, it's uh, all a matter of uh, where you're going to apply the tube and what you need it for. Uh, so uh, I'm going to fast forward here a little bit and we're going to uh, get up to the point where I'm ready to put the uh, doublers on.
Okay, here we are up to the point where I'm putting just a little bit more resin on the outside of the tube to make sure that it's uh, completely wetted out and I'm ready to begin to apply doublers. I'm going to apply this uh, trapezoid shaped uh, piece uh, in the middle because that's where I'm going to cut the tube in half to make the two pieces of tubing that I need. So each end of the two pieces of tubing that I'm making are going to have uh, tapered wall thicknesses. And uh, as you roll the tube on a tapered piece of cloth like this, uh, the wall thickness will uh, increase as you go towards uh, the one end of the cloth. And you'll see that happen here shortly. I'm getting the uh, piece wrapped around. I just roll the tube up on it and make sure that I get that down snug to the previous layup. Uh, I'm having some issues here with the uh, edges of the cloth. Uh, that's always a problem with a cut edge of composite cloth. When I make uh, longer versions of these tubes or I'm making more of them, I set up a uh, tool uh, where I have a pivot point at each end of the tube and the tube is suspended above the floor in front of me and I can work freely away from the table. And that way I can use both hands to work the cloth uh, because the tube is held uh, at the two ends by the pivots. Uh, I put a little... Uh, a ratchet lock on the one end so that I can rotate the tube in one direction and it stays in the position I put it. Uh, it doesn't back up and release the fabric. Now here I'm working out the uh, ends of the cloth and making sure that all the little loose ends are pressed down and so forth. The cloth I was using here is a 2x2 two two twill. Uh, I used it because it's the cloth that I had laying around. It's extra scrap. But it is more difficult to work with in making tubing. And it has a tendency to skew sideways very easily. Uh, moves on the bias easily. And the ends fray up a lot easier like this. So you'll see me fiddle around with it a bit here. Uh, but it gives the same mechanical properties as regular bi-directional woven cloth, which is what I recommend for making standard tubing. So what you see here is I've applied a piece that will, uh, at its ends, uh, there's one layer of cloth thick. That's the sleeve that I put on. And as you get towards the middle of that doubler, it's about four layers thick. And it's essentially a linear taper. Uh, from uh, one end to the other end. Now I'm applying a uh, straight on one side, tapered on the other side piece at either end of the tube. Uh, These will be uh, the ends that I mount in the test fixture, fixture uh, for when I test these tubes. Uh, this will give me uh, a straight taper from one layer to four layers as I go towards the end of the tube. So the one that I just applied to the middle is essentially two of these uh, butted side to side how I cut the cloth. And uh, you can imagine that you could cut the cloth in a wide variety of ways uh, to give you a different uh, tapers on the wall thickness. Now, of course, this is a wall thickness of the tube that uh, is not on the inside, it's on the outside. The inside of the tube is constant diameter. The outside of the tube uh, is then tapered at various spots. Uh, if you need tubing that's straight on the outside, uh, then you have a different issue and you need to make it a different way. Probably just going to make it a constant wall thickness along its entire length. And I'm gonna I'm getting the ends smoothed out here. Make sure they're all down tight before I do the over wrap of the uh, peel ply bleeder layer. And this is where it can get a little messy sometimes. If you do have the tools set up to hold the tube at either end and allow it to rotate in one direction only, much easier to work on. And if especially if you're making a piece of tubing that's uh, seven, eight, nine, ten feet long, you'll want to set that tool up so that you can work with the cloth in the open. Now, the other reason that you saw me wet out the cloth on the table, I, I should mention this now, is to prevent going too resin rich with the cloth. What happens is, is that you wet out the cloth uh, on a plastic or paper surface. And uh, when you lift up the cloth off of that surface, you leave a fair amount of resin behind. And that would be the resin that's not really needed in the layup. You want to try to get as close to a 60-40 uh, uh, weight ratio on resin to fabric. Uh, for wet layups, that's about the best that you can expect. About 60% of your weight will be in resin and the remainder is in cloth. Now here you see me starting a wrap of some 1.8 ounce uh, Dacron uh, peel ply layer. This is also my bleeder layer. For this particular piece of tubing, I'm not putting on any uh, paper or cloth to absorb the excess resin. Uh, 
uh, because the tubing is mostly one layer thick, there's really not a lot of extra resin. And uh, the amount of extra resin that's going to come out of the tube uh, during the shrink wrap and uh, curing process uh, will be taken up by just the bleeder layer itself. So there's really no need for additional cloth. If you are making tubing that's, say, five or six layers thick, uh, then you probably want to uh, wrap some paper towel around or some uh, bleeder cloth uh, to soak up that extra resin. Now, I'm doing a spiral wrap here. Uh, that's almost absolutely necessary. If you try to do just a straight wrap of the uh, bleeder cloth, you'll find it very hard to finish off the edge. Tape doesn't really stick to it, and uh, you'll get buckles and so forth in it. Uh, I'm applying tension to the cloth with my right hand uh, to hold it tight to the tube while I rotate the tube with my left hand. And uh, it, you, if you just try to do it as a straight wrap, you're going to get buckles in it. This uh, cloth has to be, uh, the bleeder cloth has to be applied uh, flat and uh, wrinkle free. Uh, if you have any wrinkles in your bleeder layer, you will get uh, buckles in your tubing and then the tubing's no good. So here I am applying the next strip. I like to cut strips that are about two inches wide. And I also like to use pinking shears to cut these strips. Uh, if you pink off uh, the edge of the Dacron cloth, you'll get much less fraying and it'll be an easier removal from the carbon fiber tube when you're done. So I'm gonna continue the wrap until I get down to the other end here. And then I'm going to proceed over wrapping this with uh, some heat shrink plastic. And let's Oh, I almost forgot. I should tell you that uh, even though I'm using the uh, 1.8 ounce Dacron uh, release material here, bleeder layer, I highly recommend the Teflon coated fiberglass. It's probably five times the cost, but it's much easier to remove cleanly from the carbon fiber tube. When you use the uh, Dacron cloth, uh, it will release, but it leaves little edges and so forth. You have to go back and do some cleanup work. So if you can afford the extra cloth, I recommend the Teflon coated fiberglass. Uh, that's uh, the Teflon coated fiberglass release material uh, available from a wide variety of places, but you get a fairly good price from aircraft spruce and specialty. So I've uh, cut off a little bit of extra at the end. I take my gloves off so I don't have gooey hands. And I, what you don't see is I wrapped some tape around uh, the end of that uh, a bleeder layer. So here I have some heat shrink plastic. You can get this from a variety of sources. The stuff that I'm using here is fairly thin. It's from, uh, you can buy it just about anywhere. It's for putting over your windows in the winter time. You stretch it over the window and you heat shrink it with a hair dryer. Um, it works out fairly good for this process. Uh, if you can find some uh, 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 material like they use for sealing food packages, uh, some polyolefin, uh, that's a little bit thicker. Uh, it has, uh, you want something that has a high shrinkage uh, ratio, uh, something that's going to shrink up really tight. This material does not pull up excessively tight, but tight enough to do the job. Um, the uh, material that's used to shrink wrap boats and so forth, it's a heavy duty uh, white or comes in blue, it comes in strips also, uh, can seem very handy, but that requires a blowtorch uh, to shrink it. Uh, and I just don't think it's a good idea to have fire in the shop where you have epoxy resins. Uh, I prefer plastic that you can uh, shrink with uh, a normal heat gun. Uh, you could probably use strips of monocoat, but that would be pretty expensive. Uh, don't put the sticky side of the monocoat inside. You want to reverse wrap it so it's on the outside. But just about any uh, heat shrinkable plastic will do the job. Now, you may be wondering why I'm not uh, vacuum bagging. Uh, I have tried uh, numerous uh, vacuum bag techniques uh, for making these tubes, and generally they apply so much pressure uh, to the tube, and because it's a wet layup and there's a lot of pressure, the tube itself will actually uh, buckle. Uh, slightly underneath the uh, vacuum bag. It's pretty pretty hard to get the vacuum bag uh, secured perfectly uh, such that when you pull the vacuum, it doesn't buckle. And if the vacuum bag buckles, well, then you're going to get a buckle in your tube. The heat shrink, uh, you spiral wrap it just like the uh, bleeder layer. And then when you heat shrink it, it uh, shrinks up nice and even and it works out well that way. Here you see me pull out my standard uh, hobby heat shrink gun. I'm going to pre-shrink it before it goes in the oven. Uh, I ran this uh, tube uh, at 100 uh, degrees to 150 degrees Fahrenheit for a couple hours and it was done. Uh, this is a room temperature cure epoxy. It doesn't require to be a uh, 
uh, cooked in an oven, uh, but uh, the, the oven speeds up the process and it gives you a nice hard tube in a couple hours that you can pull off the mandrel. So this way you can actually make uh, several tubes in a day. Uh, it's a nice quick process. You just keep the oven running and uh, while one tube is cooking, you're setting up the next one. Uh, as many mandrels as you have, you can cycle them through and make your tubing uh, fairly quickly this way. So I'm heat shrinking the uh, entire plastic covering uh, uh, and this thing's going to go out to the oven. Uh, you'll note here at the end of the tube you might see a hole going by there. There's a good reason for that hole in the end of the tube and you're going to see later where I uh, put a bolt through that hole and uh, I have a friendly tree in my backyard uh, with a hole in it that fits that bolt and that's what holds the under, other end of the tube. Well, see, we're back here already. I've already pulled uh, the carbon fiber tube off, and you see me begin to remove the uh, release material from inside. That bolt uh, goes in a hole in the tree and allows me to grab a hold of the carbon fiber tube and uh, slide it off the mandrel. A little bit of twisting and tugging, and it comes off. And then what you'll have is uh, a piece of the uh, polyester or uh, wrap that was around the aluminum tube on the inside of the uh, composite tube that you've made and you have to remove that of course uh, because you're going to be uh, bonding parts to it. Uh, so I'm cleaning up the end of the uh, composite tube here so I can get a good grip with a pair of pliers on the uh, polyester plastic on the inside and then I simply rotate the carbon fiber tube uh, until all of the plastic peels loose. Um, sorry, I don't have any video out in the backyard of me pulling the tube off of the uh, uh, mandrel, but it's really pretty easy. Don't forget to cut the tape. Uh, remember, we taped the polyester to the aluminum tube, and you can tug all you want, but unless you uh, cut that uh, tape loose, uh, you're not going to get the uh, carbon fiber tube off of the mandrel. Now, I am uh, struggling a little here to remove the plastic from the inside because I'm a little worried about damaging the tube. The tube itself in the middle is only one layer thick, and if I grip it really tight in my hands uh, in order to uh, pull the plastic out from the inside, I'll crush the tube instantly. So I'm trying to grab it with pliers here and twist it around at both ends. And then, oop, oh, there, it broke a little bit. Get a little piece out. Uh, and there's a variety of tricks that you can use. I think you're going to see one here. I'm going to grab the mandrel and uh, I've uh, flipped over the ends of the plastic on the inside, shove it back over the mandrel and uh, use the mandrel itself to uh, peel the plastic loose uh, from the inside. Uh, you got to fold over the edges first uh, so that they stick up a little and uh, the edge of the uh, mandrel will uh, compress them and help push out the other end. Then I'm going to do more twisting and wrapping on the other end. And this is a little bit of fiddly work, uh, but when you consider the amount of money that you're going to be saving, uh, the amount of fiddly work that you have to do is, uh, I think, can be justified. Uh, the other reason that this uh, plastic is uh, somewhat stuck inside of this tube is because I used the frosted uh, scotch tape instead of the clear stuff and it has a tendency to stick to the epoxy and uh, a little more mold release in the right tape and this will come out much easier. The smaller the diameter tube, the harder it is to get this plastic out. Ooh, there you see the carbon fiber tube flexing. This is always the fun part. Uh, get it out without damaging the tube. So let's uh, jump forward to the final uh, removal method and you'll see how I got the plastic out of the tube. Okay, here we go. This will do the trick. I got a piece of wood dowel. That's the same size as the inside of the tube. I bought this dowel for making fittings in the end. And because it's solid and not a, a tube like the mandrel, it can get a hold of the edge of the plastic and it crumples it up and just shoves it out the other end. So uh, use your imagination, a few little tricks, and uh, you'll uh, get that plastic out of there. And I finished up here with a tubing that weighs... Uh, at the single layer of thickness, it only weighs about four tenths of an ounce uh, per foot. Uh, so it's uh, really, really lightweight and very strong in torsion. I'm measuring here to cut it in half. I'm going to cut on that doubler and I'm going to end up with two pieces of tubing that have uh, doublers at each end. So there's the basic process. Uh, you can follow the same basic process and just do a roll wrap. Uh, I'll probably have a, a podcast in the future on my Patreon channel uh, where we'll actually walk through uh, live streaming, uh, making some of this tubing. You can ask questions as I go along. So if you visit my Patreon site, uh, please sign up and uh, get ready for those podcasts. And we'll have some uh, lessons as we go along. Thanks for coming today. It was fun. Come back again. Bye.